whole whole thing behind Gen 13 is that the kids really are kids. They're um, growing up still, even though they gain these incredible powers. Tell us more about the Gen 13 animated movie. Well, it's going to be coming out probably next fall. Um, definitely a Christmas release. And it's going to be, there will be a PG-13 version that's going to come out direct to video. How does the Gen 13 movie differ from the comic book? Um, well, in adapting the comic book to film, it's, uh, it's the structure, the story structure is going to be a bit different. I'm, I'm taking the first five issues of Gen 13, and I'm, well, I'm, I'm turning them into a movie. Bliss, Burnout, and Rainmaker are not going to be very prominent. They won't turn into superheroes in this movie. Why not? Well, because there's just too many characters. Could to try and get into a 70-minute movie. Could it be because Rainmaker has the powers to manipulate the forces of nature to devastating effect? And if she has those powers, then she could end the movie. Like, simply, there's no conflict. Nah, Caitlin is obviously the star of the movie. Mm -hmm. And she's pretty tight with Roxy and Grunge. Do you think the sexuality in the comic book makes it inaccessible to the females in your audience? I think that, traditionally, it seems like the superhero market has been um, pretty much more more male dominated certainly certainly and um, like you know, there's mostly guys are drawing the comics mm -hmm. so that 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 there is some truth to that however mostly guys are drawing the comics okay <laughs> but gee i would have never figured it's hard for people to admit that um, that is what yeah. young guys want to see do the Gen 13 characters have potential to become lasting cultural icons like Batman or Superman or Speed Racer? Well, they definitely have that potential, I think. Um, it's hard to say. Do you think it'll happen in what year? <laughs> Gen 13 is the latest in a long list of teenage comic book heroes. Here's Nick to tell us all about it. Teenagers have been in college for a long time. All the way back to Batman's old sidekick Robin, who debuted in 1940. With a few exceptions, teenagers were pretty much all sidekicks, like Captain America's Bucky, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, and Captain Marvel Jr. Then in 1961, Marvel broke new ground by giving a nerdy high school kid the spotlight when he became a hero called Spider-Man. Despite early predictions, Spidey became a comic book legend and teen characters were suddenly very hot. Soon came the Teen Titans, featuring Robin, Wonder Girl, and Kid Flash. With current titles featuring teen superheroes such as Superboy, Generation X, Impulse, and of course, Gen 13, it seems teen superheroes are here to stay. So what do you think? Is there a difference? I think what makes a comic book a teen comic is if the elements relate to us fantasy that you can never really experience. I think it's the uh, more adult-oriented content. They're more violent. The art tends to be more adult-oriented in general. And, uh, you know, it's just the adult storylines. I think kids' comic books tend to, to lean themselves more toward child stories than full-blown adult stories. And it's a nice medium. Photocopied characters and storylines that have been reused and reused for the past 15 years. I think it's the teenage angst, it's the teenage love, interests, and all the things they're interested in. Sex. <laughs> no food, no water. What comics would you like on a desert island? I would take uh, the Acme Novelty Library. I would probably take Bone and Mean World. Coming up next, Comicopia followed by some swanky accordion music. You don't have it? Don't! Welcome to Comicopia, my weekly review of the comic books. This week I'm focusing in on the many incarnations of teenagers in comic books, my first book being Generation X. A definite teen book, this month Chamber is left alone to fight Omega Red. Only the non-loser shall prevail. Since the regular artist, 
Chris Bacciolo isn't drawing this issue, I have to give it three out of five Gs on the anti-gravity scale. Okay, next up we have Goofballs. It's not really a comic book and it's not for teenagers, but hey, it's still a mega cool zine, and that is why I give it four, count of four, Gs on the anti-gravity scale. Next up I have the latest issue of Robin. In this underworld crossover, Robin must escape from the clutches of a killer moth and get home in time to do his algebra homework. I hate it when that happens. With great art and great story, this book gets 3.5 Gs on the anti-gravity scale. Okay, next we have Archie. This is a book about teenagers, but since teenagers don't really read it, I can only give it 2.5 Gs on the anti-gravity scale. Next we have Punks, number three. A very witty book by the same guy who brought you Trencher. Ugh. Luckily, this book has teenage characters that I can really relate to. And an anti-gravity room tip about this book, the artist Bernard Chang decided to subliminally plug us by inserting the letters AGR on this building, or anti-gravity room. For giving us this plug, this book gets, out of five, seven Gs on the anti-gravity scale. Don't you just love teenagers, folks? That's it for Comicopia this week. Okay, this week on AGR, we're going to be reviewing Warhawk, which is the newest of flight simulation games from Sony for the Sony PlayStation. Listen to this. Warhawk is a sort of flight simulation game. I'd have to say it's a cross between a flight simulation game and an adventure game because there's also a storyline. There's video at the beginning. First of all, actually watch the opening. Your mission's a little different. Krill's been using some kind of new fuel source, and I want you two to find it. Uh, nothing like a little search and destroy, right, Hatch? Walker, you misread your briefing. I want you to go into the hot zone and bring that fuel source back. Lock it down and power it up! We have a priority one launch! Where did they get these actors? They come with acting lessons. Anyway, so you're in a actual military helicopter, and you have to cover different objects, different things for the adventure, and you have different levels you go through. Now, the one thing is, it's a hard game to get used to because of the controls. How many buttons are on this thing? And you're using all of them for Warhawk. Once you get used to the controls, though, it's a great, great game. The only thing I can say that is bad about the game is that it lacks certain levels. It doesn't take too long to go through the whole adventure once you do get used to controlling the helicopter. So for that, I'd have to shave off a whole G. Four out of five Gs because, well, not enough levels. Warhawk. It's a good game, though. I'd buy it. The teenagers of Generation Y are way different from the slackers of Generation X. Here's author Douglas Copeland with his views. Hi, I'm Jennifer Cowan. I'm the producer and director of the film Douglas Copeland, Close Personal Friend, which is a wonky little odyssey about the ideas of Doug Copeland, who's the author of Generation X, Shampoo Planet, Life After God, and Microsurf. Basically, Doug and I sat down for a couple of days and we watched uh, cartoons, we watched rock videos, we went to the art gallery and we talked a lot about his ideas. Change doesn't bug me. I tend to look at all these new changes the way I used to look at those old holes they used in Warner Brothers cartoons. Remember when Daffy Duck was in a fix, he'd reach into his pocket and pull out a cartoon hole and throw it in the ground and jump into it and escape. Well, I always used to wonder what it was you'd find at the other end of the hole, where it was you'd end up being. He's a very sort of pop-centric thinker, and I think what's interesting about him is that he writes a sort of pop-centric literature, which is to say that all the ideas that, that he's fixated on and concentrates on are so contemporary and so now and so about a certain mindset. The mind, when the stories take on this sort of iconographic life. Oops, I was spooking there for a minute. That's compressing data like a computer. The word I was trying to get out was iconoplastic. I think Doug will never shake the phenomenon that is and that was and continues to be Generation X. And I think that, you know, that's a great point of pride and also probably a great nemesis and an albatross as well. Soul. During the time that we were working on the project, he wrote an article for Details Magazine talking, declaring Generation X dead certainly in his eyes because it's something that keeps coming up again and again and again. I wanted to create a time capsule, something that was a little piece of, t of television that was completely exemplary of the time. But time, you said that technology has, well, mutated time in a way. How? 
Well, I think people will remember the late 20th century as a place obsessed with efficiency, a place where people cram more and more productivity into fewer time slots, a place where humans invented all these inventions to speed up the flow of information. Uh, FedEx, Prozac, microwave ovens, fax machines, but then it all backfired. Pop culture is, is what this time and this culture is all about right now. You cannot escape it. Body. 200 years ago, the only people who had mirrors were kings and queens, and people didn't even know what they looked like. And nowadays, gosh, people use their bodies as marketing tools, as resumes. It's a really strange point in history. Um, in a way, people have become their own focus group. He's able to convey these ideas of, of our little pop culture time so succinctly, and we all relate to it. So I think that, that he will definitely be remembered as, as someone who was able to really tell us what our lives were about in the 90s. What if I took a stick of dynamite and put it inside you and blew you up like a cartoon Sylvester the Cat? How does he know this stuff, you know? But he really, he gets it. So I'm curious to see what he comes up with next. After these messages, Phil shows us how to score cool stuff in the toy collecting business. And we find out about some of the young artists behind the swanky accordion revival. When we first came here, we saw that there were three swings, six horses, one slide and one set of monkey bars for 120 children. We looked around, we realized these kids that come here really need a heck of a lot more. What do you suppose would happen if everyone decided to put just a weekend's worth of effort back into their community? Building, renovating, whatever. Things might just begin to change, which is why on one weekend in June, a group of Saturn retailers, owners, and team members got together and built 12 playgrounds in the New York area. And while in the grand scheme of things, that may not seem like much, it's a start. collect stuff and if you're smart you'll make some money on the side while doing it. Bill collects action figures and he's got some hot tips on finding the key stuff. All right we're here in front of Irwin in the cold Canadian winter look and we're at Irwin where they make and the gurgling guts eyeball. With me is Paul McGuire. That's right we're here at the Mecca this is like a temple for a lot of people this is where a lot of action figures actually get produced and the ideas are come up with here. Right on, and we're gonna check out the spawn action figures, eh? And talk to my buddy Paul Waxman! Woohoo! Now, out of the spawn stuff, do you know who, who's the major age group that's collecting this stuff? Well, we've isolated what we think are three groups, and those are younger kids, uh, young adults, which are teenagers, 13 to 17, and then the bulk, which is 18 and up. Here we've got a bad rock figure, and you can see that this guy is blue, and that's how he originally appeared in the, uh, in the first series. And then, when, uh, when he appeared in the second series, he's shirtless, oh. and he's got uh, red pants, and he's changed basically to a completely different looking figure. This would classify as a repaint. And you can really see when you hold them side by side that this guy is painted in a completely different manner where this guy is sort of a yellowish green. Yeah. This guy's definitely got all sorts of red and almost purplish blotches on his stomach, on his legs. He looks like he's been speckled. He knows who's reading his comics. He knows the guys who are collecting his toys. And he says, let's make it a game. You know, let's have people out there hunting and let's, uh, let's really drive the market and make it fun for people and, and give them something uh, of value when they, when they actually find it. So I think, I think those are the sort of driving forces. It's been an ongoing problem in the U.S. and the majors like Target and, and Toys R Us that 
the staff is actually hoarding them for either collectors or for themselves because they know that at some point in time they're going to be valuable. So right. it's a problem, but it also, in an indirect way, enhances the collectability and the drive to find these even, you know, they become even more rare. Obviously, because of the volume that Toys R Us and the other majors do with us, we ship them priority. But uh, we certainly have dedicated salespeople who just look after the small accounts, and we make sure that everybody gets a piece of the action. All right, Paul, man, what else do you have to show? Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Paul, how's it going? How's it going, Paul? Paul? Yeah. Paul, this is Paul. Where were you, man? I was just... In the washroom. All right, cool. You got anything else to show us? I got lots to show you guys. Walk this way. This way? <laughs> well, Phil, as you can see, we're in the bowels of Irwin. And uh, as we like to say, welcome. This is so cool, man. Did you see this? This is wicked. It's some really interesting stuff hidden away here in the bowels. And uh, Ted Shackelford. This is a space breezing doll along the lines of what we were talking about, about being collectible. There's only... This is great, man. I love it here. Who was that mess, man? In addition to being Ted Shackelford, there was only from five... From Knott's Landing. From Knott's Landing. Did you say Ted Shackelford? Check this out. Uh, what makes this toy special is the fact that there was only 500 of these brought into the North American marketplace. So there are so 500 again. Ted Shackelfords, that's it? That's it. And last but not least, the, uh, the three-inch figures of all the different uh, characters in the show. There's Ted Shackelford. There's Ted again. And there's Ted Not again, dolls. and Ted again. Well, unbelievable. Over at Irwin. All right, man, thanks a lot. You know what? If Paul were here, he'd say goodbye and thank you, too, but he's playing with Sailor Moon. Goodbye, man. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Dave Watkins is a guy who doesn't collect stuff, but he is an artist who runs a school for artists ages 10 through 20. And here's what he had to say about the new generation of future comic book legends. I call this fish in a postmodern society. Josh, you're a true artist. Wow. I like my new friends. I'm here with Dave Watkins at his own shock studio. How you doing, Phil? Good to see you, man. Good seeing you, Dave. Good. Just tell me about this place. Well, uh, it's uh, just a situation where a lot of artists can come and hang out and draw and get better, and uh, we're going to be producing our own stuff real soon. Uh, working on a lot of the business plan and everything right now. And uh, we got a lot of really good young artists who are really going to be up and coming. I'm Robin. I'm Manu. I'm Vaughn. I'm Jonathan. Now, do you guys think teenagers are depicted realistically in comic books? If you look at like a normal teenager, they're still kind of like scrawny sort of thing, right? But them, they're all like super built and stuff like that. It's, it's just not realistic. Yeah. Now, how do you think the next generation of comic book artists Will differ from the ones today. I think um, the introduction of computers into the industry is going to change it a lot because you can use a lot of computer animation generation colors to enhance the comic book's qualities. Now do you guys see a trend happening in comics? There's a lot of um, stuff that are being ja Japanese oriented type comic book stuff going on to pretty much like the weaponry from Japanese cartoons, pretty much the style from Japanese cartoons. A lot of companies is really like um, trying to pick up the style, pretty much like bite the style. What are your goals as comic book artists? I think my personal goal as a comic book artist is to just try my hardest and, and learn all I can before I go into the field so that when I get there I can just blow everybody away. I would say that they're the next generation of comic book artists. What do you think they have to offer for the future? Anything different? Well, I think they're offering a, a hopeful mindset. I think that a lot of despair has kind of gone through our generation and, and, and things of uh, kind of a hopelessness. And you can see it in the books. There's a lot of, uh, you know, blood and gore and guns and everything like that. But I think a lot of these guys are actually offering something a little different. It's a little more thoughtful and, uh, and, and something that's a little more hopeful for the future, that things are going to change and we can actually pick up and change a lot of the stuff that's happening in our world today. So I, I'm really uh, hopeful and I'm really grateful for some of the things that I'm learning from these guys as far as uh, a lot of the, the teenagers that come in, as far as what they're uh, bringing into the studio. I think it's really dynamic. We're going to cover some email responses and check out Phil's favorite polka bands after this. Starquest, a sci-fi channel planetary premiere, Saturday, March.
March 16th at 8, 5 Pacific. 1996. Leap year, and the planet is getting one extra day. But at the Sci-Fi Channel, it's Quantum Leap Year, and instead of one more day, you get extra lifetimes. Your name is Maxwell Stoddard, Henry Adams. You're a blood-sucking ghoul from Bro. hell! It's a Quantum Leap Year Marathon, hosted by Scott Bakula. I've been here before. The Quantum Leap Year Marathon on the Sci-Fi Channel begins at 9 a.m. Eastern, Sci-Fi Thursday. Word of caution, this beast is bigger, with hairier levels, monster graphics, and a new primate, Dixie Kong. It's ready and waiting for your Super NES. Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. It's even tougher than the original. again to register your response with the anti-gravitational pull. Send us some stuff. Now this email is from Powerball 3 on America Online and he writes, I hate your show. It's so depressing. I hope it gets cancelled. Those kids on your show are horrible. I feel sorry for anyone who likes your show. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, times 20. Well, oh, wait a sec. This was supposed to go to the cast of Baywatch. And this one's from Chase who says, I inferred from the tone of your correspondence that you suffer from deep conflicts which can make you impulsive, immoral, and reckless. I suggest a private therapy session, say my place, midnight, and wear something rubber. This is a problem with email. Okay, let's just move on. Now, name two things you'd find in an anti-gravity room. Not the show, an actual room. Two things. You can call or you can email us at antigravity at ytv.ca or write to us at the anti-gravity room care of YTV Canada, 64 Jefferson Avenue, Unit 18, Toronto, Canada, M6K, 3H3. And just as a reminder, don't forget to check us out on the World Wide Web address on your screen, http colon slash slash www.digiweb.com slash antigrav slash. Next time on the Anti-Gravity Room, the Legends of Comic Books in a Texas cage match fight till the finish. Well, that's the show. Looks like the youth of today is in good hands. Yep, we're doing pretty good. Who knows, maybe we've just interviewed a star in the making. As a member of the youth of today, I'd just like to say, only you can prevent the rise of swanky accordion music. See you next time on the Anti-Gravity Room. It can't be bargained with, it can't feel pity, it has no fear, and it will not stop until you are dead. Arnold Schwarzenegger stars in the sci-fi action classic, The Terminator, Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Now stay tuned for Sci-Fi Buzz, next on the Sci-Fi Channel. his neighbor upstairs and totally drove her insane. If you've ever watched daytime talk shows like Ricky Lake, you know people love to spill their guts. People are, you know, they really want to know what people are capable of. They want to, they want to do a comparison and say, hey, you know, how bad am I compared to other people? You know, I, I know the worst thing I've ever done, but how bad are, are other people? We've all read George Orwell's Animal Farm, right? Well, if you haven't, maybe these will jog your memory. We spoke with John Mueller, creator, writer, and artist of Oink, the tale of a pig man in a nihilistic future. 
Punk is, uh, it's my first book, it's my first waltz into the world of comics, and uh, I kind of really wanted to take a different slant on things. The story pretty much revolves around a, a character who's uh, forced basically to take his own kind of slaughter, and he, at, at, at some point in the story, he, he kind of wakes up and has kind of a, a kind of a, an awakening to sort into, into the reality that he's actually in, uh, in the city of heaven, which is, with where the story takes place. Um, and I like using a lot of the, the, the I guess, mythological ideas of, of a city called Heaven, a place, an actual, an actual place that, uh, you know, isn't, isn't all it was cracked up to be. There's definitely a lot of metaphors in there. I mean, I, I throw everything in there from, I mean, the slaughterhouse, where he starts from, is basically my experiences through public high school, you know? I mean, that's what it was about. It just kind of took on its own life because it's become my own little soapbox. I've always collected comics, uh, you know, since I was a kid. Uh, I, I remember, you know, reading Mike Manola's Alpha Flights, uh, you know, with, way back when him and Sam Kevich and Frank Miller were all working for Marvel, and those guys were huge influences on me, and, and I, I loved comic books, and, you know, since I was a kid, and kind of got away from it when I got older, because the material just didn't attract me anymore. The nice thing was when I saw work like, you know, Electro Assassin and, uh, uh, and, and things like that being done, I, 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 you know, I said comic books have grown up and I wanted to be part of that. As far as new projects, the new projects uh, that I've been asked to, to come on, um, The Crow seems to be, uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about me doing uh, pro work. I, I'm, I've already started doing coverage for the new series Wild Justice and uh, I'm just having a blast with it. It's like right up my alley. We require information. What underground are what underground or self-published comics do you read, and why? Uh, the reason why I like independent comics is uh, the stories are usually a lot different from the mainstream comics, and so is the artwork, and it's really, um, really new and uh, just more enjoyable than the mainstream stuff. First and foremost, I read uh, Ragmob, because it's uh, done by a friend of mine, Rob Walt. I actually got to do uh, color on one of the covers. And I also like to read uh, Charles Vess's uh, Ballads and Sagas. My favorite fringe comics are Bob Bingerman's Minimum Wage, Art Babe by Jessica Abel, and uh, Jinx by Brian Michael Bendis. They're three different takes on three different subjects, and they're, they're the best comics value uh, in, in the world, I guess. My favorite alternative, Vampirella. Great action, great heroine. The Crow, Scud, and Comic Jam coming up. When others ask you... Okay, I'm here at Le Dome Banquet Hall in Oakville, Ontario, where there's an actual real wedding going on over there, which is very, very cool. Now, today we're going to be reviewing a video game from Nintendo, and it's the Super NES. We're getting nostalgia. We're going a step back to Ken Griffey Jr.'s Winning Run Baseball. Now, first off, we're going back, SNES. We're not taking the next step to the CD-ROM stuff right now, but now I know why they call it the next step, because I'm on the old step and I don't like it. Now first off, I hate it when they have baseball games and they don't use the real players. Now you can do the trades and all the players improve as the season goes on and do all that stuff and their averages keep going as, as you get more hits, but I don't like the names like Tony Bennett and Joey Jeremiah and Billy Bennett. Okay, but the game itself actually isn't too bad because it takes a long time usually for most baseball games to figure out, right? I mean, sometimes you gotta pick the guy off, you gotta steal, you gotta, all of a sudden when there's a hit, you gotta switch over to this big large screen and you gotta figure out which player can go and catch the ball. It didn't take me too long with this game, but the thing is I miss stuff like camera angles changing. I miss real names and I miss an audience where everybody actually has a different shirt on. So, Ken Griffey Jr. winning run baseball, I have to give it like two G's out of five on the anti-gravity scale. And I actually give it two G's just because it wasn't that hard a game to figure out and I got a hang of it pretty early in the game. You're out! The Crow is such a successful comic that it was made into a movie with a sequel that will be featured in an upcoming show. We spoke to the creator of The Crow, James O'Barr, in Detroit. Thank you. Greg! Now, if you're not familiar with the name James O'Barr, he's responsible for The Crow, the original comic books, all the merchandise, and the original movie. Right now, Dead Time's coming out, the new Crow book, and a second Crow movie. Let's go see if we can find it.
Okay, just for our viewers, could you tell us who you are? James O'Barr. Hey, James O'Barr, very cool. Now, when, let's start with the crow. Now, did you think that the story, the comic book, everything would just snowball into what it became? Big cult following, huge? No, no, I thought it had a really limited appeal. Um, when they when they first printed 10,000 copies, I thought they were crazy, but it's sold like half a million copies worldwide now. So yeah, I'm pretty surprised. To me, The Crow was a love story. Some people thought it was about violence and fighting, but I mean, did you agree with me? Was that what it was to you? Yeah, it was intended as a love story. Um, you know, it's which justifies all the violence in it. And uh, I think Brandon made it something really personal. Speaking of the movie, tell me about your cameo. Not too many people know that, and I have the card, the actual kitchen sink card of James O'Barr stealing a television. You always steal TVs? Mm -hmm. well, I used to steal refrigerators, but I'm a lot older now. No, I just happened to be on the set then, and they needed they needed some people for a crowd scene, and so I wandered over there. And uh, when they were doing the prints, they just zoomed in on me for some reason. Comics is still my main interest. Uh, not deserting the comics field for the movie industry. I, I like comics a lot better. There's a lot more control there. I'm working on two or three other series, um, comic book series, and I have, I think, seven, uh, seven covers and a couple prints coming out. Um, I'm working on a, a comic strip called Gothic, which is Blade Runner meets The Wizard of Oz. It deals with a lot of the same themes that are in The Crow, and it's, it's dark and rainy and depressing. Um, I have to say it's true to my form, I guess. So what would you say is the James O'Barr stamp on, on your work? The story? Men in black lipstick. James O'Barr. Thanks a lot, Jay. Where do you go when you want the latest alternative comics and zines? Well, here in Hollywood, it's Meltdown. Another place is Toronto, where we talk to the guys at Comic Jam, a gathering of indie comic and zine enthusiasts. Hi, I'm Rupert Bottenberg, and I organize the Comic Jams. If you look around here, you can see it's just divided into two parts. Upstairs, I've got rock bands playing right now, and I've got uh, other weirdness. I've got a magician playing, uh, doing, doing tricks tonight. Uh, and then down here, I've got a room full of cartoonists who are doing strictly collaborative comic strips. That is, they will, uh, someone will take a page, draw a panel, and then pass it along to someone else. This isn't the best place maybe to do collaborative work, because it is a little confusing, but this, this stuff is more fun. Doing collaborative work is really important and interesting. It's nice to get together with people and, and it's, it, sometimes it's easier that way because you can bounce things off people and stuff. Well, for starters, cartoonists. That's my uh, most reliable sort of draw is uh, amateur, semi-pro, and even a few talented professional cartoonists. Um, almost all of whom fall into the category of alternative or fringe cartoonist. It's really that sort of thing. My name's Jay Stevens, and I do a couple of comics, one called uh, Land of Nod for Black Eye Productions, and one called Atomic City Tales for Kitchen Sing. And um, I love these comics jams. I'm, I'm basically here because a lot of my friends are here, and most of us cartoonists work out of our studios all by ourselves most of the time, and don't really get to interact a lot with uh, our peers and with some of the people that, that read what we do, so that's what these things are great for. I love the collaboration, actually. It's, it's actually really refreshing to see how somebody else interprets where you're going with something. I, I think you, you can learn a lot, actually, from this kind of stuff. There have been other people that sort of used similar ideas, but strictly what I'm doing here is pretty unique. But I don't really want that to, to continue. I'd like to see other people pick up on the idea. I don't want to have to keep doing this for the rest of my life. I'd like other people to pick up on the idea and do it in their own community. I'd like to see every city have a common chance. Lethargic Lad is not the narcoleptic member of the Legion of Superheroes. It is, though, one of the funniest magazines to come out since, well, Sassy. Greg Highland, a Toronto native, told us the shocking true story of Lethargic Lad. Please note, this story may be amusing to some viewers. I am Greg Highland. I do a book called Lethargic Lad. Some people think that I'm lethargic. He started out as like a notebook doodle from when I was in high school, and I just kind of liked the design. It's very simple. He's one of those characters that when people see him, they say, hey, I can draw that. Lethargic Lad is, uh, he's, he's 
the opposite of an exciting superhero. He has no powers. He doesn't even talk. There's lots of other characters in the lethargic universe. There's Walrus Boy, uh, who's bitten by a radioactive walrus, and there's Guy with a Gun, who is a guy with a gun. The No Mutants, they're a team of non-mutants. None of them have superpowers. Totally ordinary people, but one wears a bucket on his head, so that's, you know. And one's an Elvis impersonator. People who we make fun of usually like what what I'm doing. For instance, Alex Ross apparently really liked when we did a Marvel's parody cover with Lethargic Lad on Fire. We did a crossover with She, and uh, half the story appeared in an issue of She, and half the story appeared in an issue of Lethargic Comics. And we got a great reaction to that, which is really why, why we did it, so that people who read She will, will read my book and vice versa. Although the vice versa was a lot less, you know. Getting the lethargic readers over, over to She. Hey, I like the ninja chick, right on. Self-publishing is, uh, it's like a box of chocolates. <laughs> no, it's not. Hey, dig me. Wee, wee. Lethargic Lad in the future, well, currently it's a three-issue miniseries and the response to it has been really, really nice. And I'm really hoping to turn it into a regular series sometime next year. This just in. The Incredible Hulk makes the jump to the small screen with an animated series featuring the voices of Lou Ferrigno, Luke Perry, and Mark Hamill. The art of Alex Ross will be on display at the Four Color Images Gallery in New York from September 6th to October 12th. There's a new Gen 13 series called Bootleg in the Works. The story arcs will diverge from the regular series and are entirely self-contained. Artists and writers currently on board are Alan Davis, Mark Farmer, Terry Moore, and Tom Coker. Scott, the disposable assassin, more fringe, and learn the true dangers of eating finishing nails next. bought the business from Jimmy's father. That's why. Hey, what's up, fellow gymnasts? I'm Nick here at the Brooklyn Bridge with Comicopia, my weekly candid love scene talking about comics. First up in this week of wacky underground fun is Low Life number three. Low Life is about Tommy, who in this issue is yet again facing love troubles. His girlfriend, Sonny, has been acting quite odd and he doesn't know what to do. Tommy and Sonny have kind of a Forrest Gump-Jenny relationship going on, which is really interesting to see portrayed in such a dark manner. The art and the conversational style of dialogue just scream out the fringe. This is truly the quintessential underground book. Well, at least Tommy doesn't have to change his hair color every two weeks. Try getting girls that way. Low life is a freaky experience, but in a cool way, so I give it four out of five Gs on the anti-gravity scale. Last, we have Creed number three. While this comic appears to be jumping on the bandwagon of teens with superpowers, it has something the others don't, a creator who is almost as young as his character. This issue is a quickie where Wonder Kid Mark has to save the world from a great void that will make the children everywhere forget what it is to dream. To this end, Mark responds by saying, bummer, and then proceeds to catch the void in a glass jar. Now that's cool. The art is very wacky with lots of cartoon influences. This matches up well with the story, which is more of the same. Even for a steep three bucks, Creed is still pretty cool, so I give it 3.5 out of 5 Gs on the anti-gravity scale. Well, that's about it from the fringe of New York City, better known as Brooklyn. See you next time. When you think of assassins, you think of groups like The Hand. We, on the other hand, think of Scud, the disposable assassin, created by Rob Schraub. Hi, I'm Rob Schraub. With Fireman Press, I do a little book called Scud the Disposable Assassin. The history of Scud is this. In the not too distant future, disposable assassins will be able to be bought out of vending machines. So if you got a problem with somebody and you want to take them out, you go up to the Scud vending machine, you put your quarters in, the robot comes out and he does damage. The great thing about these disposable assassins, because they are disposable assassins, is that they self-destruct after they terminate their target. Our Scud, in particular, doesn't want to die. And when he finds out that he's going to self-destruct after he finishes his mission, he doesn't want to finish his mission. 
So he gets into a fight with this this monster here. This monster is pretty bizarre. It's got a plug for a head, a squid for uh, a chest. It's got mouths on his knees and hands instead of feet, mouse trap hands. What happens is he mortally wounds the creature and puts it on life support in the hospital. So now he's got to become a freelance assassin to pay for the hospital bills. So the rest of the series is uh, him running around working for like the mob, terrorist organizations, taking out uh, uh, rival gangsters, things like that. We basically have made an entire universe where we can do anything we want. I started going back to my old high school um, heroes and comic books. And I went back into comic books and I was very depressed at the fact that all the comic book characters today are very evil, they're very negative looking, and they're the heroes. They're always complaining and they're always crying. I mean, they're really big guys, but they're always complaining about their law, their dead parents, their dead girlfriends or whatever. So I developed Scud as like an anti version of like the Dark Knight typical superheroes that are out there right now. Scott is very simple looking and he's yellow, he's bright yellow, and he's very, very skinny. About issue number three, we start getting some interest in Hollywood because we have a real animated look to ours, our, our book, and we started shopping the book around. Uh, and we sent it to uh, Oliver Stone's company. He made Platoon, Natural Born Killers, and JFK. So what is Oliver Stone's next project? Scud the Disposable Assassin. Everything's happening so fast. It's really hard to stay in rea reality, but I, I've, I've always had a problem with that. <laughs> We've got your mail and thumb wrestling after this. I am the ultimate thumb warrior, but I'm the thumb maniac. Uh, uh, uh. We reached into the mailbag and found this week's lucky winners. Ben Rivers writes, I am absolutely taken by Japanese art and animation, and I would love an AGR episode dedicated to the field. Well, if you haven't been tested for psychic powers, Ben, then check yourself into the nearest paranormal research facility because we have an episode of anime and manga coming up. Wow, I can't believe this is just like my new movie, Phenomenon is Psychotic. Chelsea asked, why do you guys give Sailor Moon the cold shoulder all the time? Well, Chelsea, it all started back when Phil had long hair. You see, he was a little jealous of Sailor Moon's naturally beautiful hair and thus the rivalry. Now that he's cut his hair, though, everything's fine. Keep sending us stuff. Let's keep the Postal Service busy. You can write to us at the Anti-Gravity Room, care of YTV Canada Inc., Station C, Toronto, Canada, M6J 3N1. Or you can email us at antigravity at ytv.ca. Don't forget to check us out on the World Wide Web at www.antigrav.com. What did you think? Not one mention of Spider-Man or his clone storyline. Pretty fringy, but there's still more where that came from. But for now, our work here is done. See you next time on the Anti-Gravity Room. Can't make it to Worldcon? Then log on to the Dominion for live chats and full coverage from the world's biggest sci-fi convention all this weekend at www.scifi.com. From somewhere underground, a secret network is transmitting a powerful signal directly to your brain. If you dare to tune in, you might just drop out forever. James Woods and Deborah Harry star in Videodrome, tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, Sci-Fi Saturday. Now stay tuned for The Odyssey, coming up next on the Sci-Fi Channel. Da-da-da!